You're listening to the AfterBuzz TV Network. Now the largest new media platform on the web and your number one source for after-show entertainment. Very good, Johnson. After Buzz TV. The AfterBuzz Studios in Los Angeles, California. Presented by Maria Menounos and Bing.com and streaming live thanks to Akamai Technologies. This is AfterBuzz TV's America's Got Talent After Show. We'll break down tonight's episode and get you all the latest news and gossip. And now, another post-game wrap-up show for your favorite TV show. It's AfterBuzz TV's America's Got Talent After Show. Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to America's Got Talent After Show here on AfterBuzz TV. We are at Season 8, Episode 2, and we are enjoying our America's Got Talent. And I am Kaori Take, and joining me... I am Daniel Weiss. Yes, Daniel Weiss. Let's get to it. Let's do it. All right, so... X. Oh, uh, what? Uh, excuse me? Nothing. All right. No beef. <laughs> So we are in San Antonio this week, and uh, there's a mariachi party, and there's the intro, and we've got Heidi Klum, Howard Stern, Howie Mandel, and Mel B all enjoying their little parade down San Antonio, and after that little show with Nick Cannon talking about how exciting the city is, we have Travis Pat, Pratt, Travis Pratt, 32 years old, and he looks like a football player. He um, decides to sing because his girlfriend brought him into America's Got Talent. I thought, okay, he is going to suck. We all have prejudgments before we actually hear them. And he was actually really good. Yeah, I thought that, I didn't know if he was going to suck. I just thought, okay, he's going to sing like R&B or maybe country. I did not know <laughs> that he was going to be an opera singer, which uh, I thought was great. Yeah, he was he, phenomenal. Not only was he an opera singer, but he sang uh, like a, a, almost like a female vocal. Yeah, a um, tenor, I yes. believe. It was called. Uh, and it oh. oh mio ba bambino caro, I had to look it yep, up. Yep, no, exactly. You pronounced it perfectly. Oh, thanks. I, I thought so. I had to do my studying. But yeah, he was really, really good. And I was really, really impressed with him. And that was a really good start to the show. Yeah, he was great. I thought, I'm always skeptical of everything on this show. Yeah. And it was a little mm -hmm. too set up the way they're like, let's bring his girlfriend on stage. Right. How long have you guys been together? Why aren't you married? Will you marry me? Yeah, we totally knew what was coming as soon as she got on stage and then they had the story about how he, how she brought him up and all that stuff. And It was still nice. It was really nice. And I wish I didn't, like, I wasn't cynical and I could just be like, that was so nice. They're <laughs> in love and now they're going to get married. And like, I'm sure that's real. But it just, I don't know, it seemed a little set up to me. But if maybe it was nothing more than, like, the producer said, hey, Howie, have his girlfriend well, come up on stage. Well, I'm sure it was set up, but what better way to end a phenomenal audition by getting a fiancé? Right. I would have loved it if he got X'd <laughs> during the proposal. Like, will you marry me? Argh. That Yeah, that would have sucked, actually. But it was really cool because after that there was a slew of romantic relationships that were going on together the next couple performing was a balancing act yeah kind of like rebecca and i forgot his name from last season let's call him gunther yeah him the the germans i believe they were i don't German. know but let's say rebecca and gunther yes rebecca and perhaps gunther uh they were from last season and this season there was a couple that performed that was similar to that did you like this act it was very it was, fast but. yeah it was okay you know, they balance on each other. It's it's one of those things that it's like, it's great strength, but it's not that entertaining to me. Mm -hmm. Like, he's doing push-ups on his girlfriend. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's a lot of strength on both of their parts. Even the person that's stable and not moving and while the other person's flexible, it's a lot of strength, but there's a lot of flexibility. And I'm very impressed by this. However, I don't know if I would, if it's a million-dollar act. Right. 
Yeah, it's something I probably couldn't do. I say probably because you never know. I'm pretty buff. For those of I you that you can't can see it. us, I'm like 315 <laughs> pounds of pure muscle. For those of you that can see us, I'm lying. <laughs> but like, I obviously couldn't do that, and it was cool. But again, like, I'm not going to watch it. Mm -hmm. If someone said, hey, check out this YouTube video of a guy balancing on his girlfriend, I'd be like, no thanks, I have a cat to look at. Yeah. Well, I think there's a... Th I love cat videos, by the way, but I do think there's a, th a theme I've noticed. Like, last season was Rebecca and Gunther, and then this season was these two cup was this two cup this couple, that they tend to work really well when they're very intimate. Do you right. know what I mean? Like, they just feel connected. Yeah, well, yeah, there's a connection. Mm -hmm. Also, getting to spend that much time together uh, makes it easier to practice all yeah, the time. Yeah, and they're really close. So. Yeah. Well, that was a good act. Yeah, it was fine. It was fine, and they, 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 they went, went through, through yeah. as well. And then there was Liesl and Ronnie, who did the ballroom dance. Yes. And what did you think of that? Um, I don't remember them, so they mm -hmm. were great. Well, they did go through. It was yeah. very short. I felt like it was a good performance, but it's not particularly the cor the right. Well, then again, America's Got Talent is for everybody, but I, d I just felt like there should be a dancing show that they could have performed in. Yeah, for me, like it's it's tough to say because I often think like if there's a class for it, it shouldn't be on America's Got Talent. Yeah, and that's a lot of things. That's dancing. That's magic and whatever. But that's like singing as well. It's everything. Mm -hmm. But I feel like there's certain things that you can rise above. But I also feel like are those guys any better ballroom dancers than their teachers? Yeah, sure. I don't know. Is that a talent? That's that's a good point. I mean, I question that too, because I'm sure there's other students that are just as good as them. What? Right. But but they're not they here, chose. and they were good. They were good, and, you know, they decided to go on America's Got Talent to win that million-dollar prize. Right. So they were entertaining, but a more entertaining group was Ruby and Jonas, 9-year-old and 10-year-old, and Ruby's brother, D'Angelo, with his partner, Amanda, who was 13 and D'Angelo was 12. And they're not a couple. They were, yes. but they're not anymore. Yes. I, I wasn't... At first, I thought... I'm jumping a little ahead, but I th at first I thought Amanda was making a joke about it, but I don't know. Maybe she was a little serious. I think so. I mean, think back to those times of being 14, mm -hmm. and I'm talking to people that aren't me because I didn't have a girlfriend until I was 17, <laughs> and that lasted three weeks. But Wow, that's a long time. Well, thank you. You know, I'm <laughs> really romantic, and the girls <laughs> love me. But back then, it's like everything's really holding hands like, oh, we're in a relationship now. I'm going home because I don't want to talk to you anymore. We're broken up. Hey, how's it going? We're back together. Yeah, I mean, things move really fast. But I also feel like if you're a 13-year-old girl, you wouldn't want to date a guy who's a year younger. That's a lot Yeah, but difference. with that talent, boy, <laughs> That's true. He was really good. And let's talk about Ruby and Jonas, the first couple, the younger couple. Ruby is a reoccurring contestant. She was there last season with the Untouchables. And you and I both recognized her. Yeah, right, uh, right away you brought it up, and I was like, yeah, you're right, which is a good thing mm -hmm. for a little girl to be like, oh, I recognize her from whatever. It's a callback, yeah. which I like. Uh, and I think that uh, her parents now are getting their third consecutive free trip to Vegas. I think so, because they were also in season six, right? Yeah, they were in season six, and then they came back with their kids in season seven, and now season eight, they're back. They're going to have to have more kids so that next year they can <laughs> continue their tradition of Vegas. <laughs> and what do they have in store of season nine? We'll see. Well, what did you think of their act, Ruby and Jonas's act? Ruby and Jonas were good. I like her. She's adorable. She's a spitfire. She is. Uh, as you said, she's a little smug, <laughs> uh, but they were good. It was, it's funny because had it been reversed, mm -hmm. had her brother gone first and they went second, I don't think I would have liked them as much because they were That's good. That's a good point. And, it, it, and it's one of those things where it's like, I'm not going to say, well, she's good for a six-year-old. She's good for a 12-year-old. As far as a good dance act, they were good, mm -hmm. but then her brother was better. Well, they also have the... Uh, maturity ahead of right. her 
but so does someone who's 35. True, true, true. But then, you know, on the flip side, I really liked Ruby and Jonas, but I, and I, I was very, very impressed with Amanda and D'Angelo. I liked their dance, but like you mentioned while we were watching it, they had a better routine as well. It was just more fun, more fast paced, and it was, there was a lot of humor in it. She picks him up at the end. It was yeah. good, and he had a prop. So there's a lot more going than just a really cool dance. Right. He was mugging it. He was like a 13 year old Buster Keaton. That's a reference that me and a bunch of 60 year old men will get. Okay. Do you want to talk about the reference? Nope. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Look up Buster Keaton. I, I'm going to look it up after the show. Um, but yeah, D'Angelo and Amanda not only did dancing, but they also had uh, some kind of comedy act, which I liked it. Right. They put showmanship into it. Exactly. Where the first ones I thought, okay, they're flailing around, they're dancing, it's fine. But uh, they actually had an act. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, Amanda and D'Angelo had the pretense of, yeah, we used to date. We don't want to date anymore. We're just dance partners. So the whole thing was really cute. It was. Right. It just worked. And what's going to happen when there's more 13-year-olds and someone's jealous and he's talking to another 13-year-old dancer? It's going to happen. She, that's that's a woman's curse. Right. Well, you know. But men do that too, don't should they? Should have been born a man. <laughs> I'm happy being a woman. I'm sure you're happy being a man. It varies. <laughs> Well, the next one was a mariachi, a mariachi band, Mariachi Novo Estero ADM. Yep, sure, that's right. Uh, I tried. Victor started the group, and he wanted to start the group because he had two daughters and a wife, and he needed to start earning money. Right, and he had no foresight into, there's going to be a baby here, maybe I should get a job. Yeah. So mariachi is the way to go. Well, I think that's very creative, that's also very um, risky to start a whole band when you have uh, two children and a wife to, to right. worry about. And you know, he, he thanks his, um, he does thank his wife and for the, all the support right. after the fact. And by the way, everyone so far went through. Um, Howard Stern hates mariachi. And Howie says, I want Howard Stern to like mariachi. So this mariachi group performs, and Howard Stern really liked it because it was unique. It wasn't just mariachi. Typical mariachi was like uh, LMFAO's uh, sexy and you know it and I know it. Right. I, I can appreciate that it was a different genre set with a different genre, but I didn't personally like it myself. What do you think? Yeah, as I said last week, I like when one type of music does a genre that's different from mm -hmm. them and different from that song. And I just, I can't place it, but it didn't work for me. One, I don't really like that song. Yeah. And I don't know. I just feel like keep trying, you know, dan dance rap party music mm -hmm. and mariachi, maybe not so much. Orchestra and uh Canadian pop star. Yeah, right. All right, Which that worked. Awesome. Last so week. it just, it you know, it depends. Like, you have to find it, uh -huh. and that wasn't it for me. Like, there's a group, I wish I could remember their name, but they are a four-piece cello orchestra mm -hmm. that does Metallica songs. That sounds really good. It's fantastic. Wow, well, hopefully you remember her name. You could pass it yeah. on. Something with Pocalypse in it. <laughs> they usually are blank Pocalypse anyway, yeah. so. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I just, I, I totally agree with you. It just wasn't hitting. I, they probably didn't pick the right song. Yeah. Even if they want to go that dance route, it just didn't feel right, in my opinion. But our opinions don't matter because the nope. judges sent them straight to Vegas. Our opinion should matter. <laughs> but they did. <laughs> they matter to me. For, and maybe they'll do something cooler next time. But again, it's like, how do you top that? Okay, they're going to do another song as mar mariachi. Yeah. Maybe they'll do something better, but it's like, how do you, what's next? Well, I, I want to ask you, do you like mariachi in general? Nah. It's not your thing, right? I like it, you know, from watching Desperado. It's good background music <laughs> for it, but I, I wouldn't listen to it. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's not my flavor either. I'm, right. with, I, I'm in agreement with Howard Stern, but. Right, and that may be it. Maybe it's just like, all right, I don't like mariachi, but there's certain things in genres mm -hmm. that, I don't like a genre, mm -hmm. but I'll like it. 
Well, here's the thing. Like, they can actually wow us. Maybe they'll have a much better song. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Maybe they'll do something great. Yeah. Um, hopefully, they're on their way to Vegas. So, well, before we continue, yes. I want to let everyone know that uh, Maria Menounos' and Kevin Undergaro's movie is now available to purchase on iTunes. Oh, thank God. It's a really good Dexter Dexterish comedy dumb and dumber movie. I saw it and it was great. Four ninety nine to rent, five ninety nine to buy. So just for a dollar more you can purchase. And not only by purchasing it will you help us stay on the show, you're just supporting us, which we love and we just love your undying support and we thank you. So check it out on iTunes. Please. Yes, and there's also Jin Molina who's phenomenal. He came by uh, Christopher Lloyd, we of course have Beth Bears, Maria Menounos. It's just a, a comical, comical movie. The Fonz. The Fonz, I mean. There's a ton Henry of people Winkler. in this. And I will be the first one to say when I go see a movie that I have friends in, I am so scared. Yeah. Because usually it's not good. And this one surprised me. Yeah, it's, it's unpredictably great. And you know what it's like? What's it Nothing like? Nothing else. That's true. It's really like it's original. Like you Completely. said, it's a mix of Dexter and comedy. Uh, and I just can't explain how good it is because it's really good. Take my word for it. You have no reason to. Yeah. So if you don't want to take his word for it, you can rent it. But if you want to take his word for it, you can even purchase it. Right. And then you'll be the guy that's like, hey, check out this thing <laughs> that you might not have heard of. That's really good. You have to see it. And by doing that, you will be supporting After Buzz. So. Right. That too. Thank you. All right. So, next one. You actually liked this girl, didn't you? The gunshot. At first. Chick. After <laughs> seeing her, I did not like her. But anyone that comes out <laughs> shooting guns dressed as Annie Oakley, I'm into. That's interesting. Is that how your girlfriend trapped you? I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> but my girlfriend was born in 1865. Uh-huh. And... She oh. lives in the Wild West. Well, thank goodness for that time machine. Right. Yeah. It's, so It's my TARDIS. <laughs> we have Pistol Pack and Paula. She's 48. Yes. And right off it, the stage, she just starts shooting, bang, bang, boom, boom. I was a little scared. I think if I was there in the audience, I would have ducked for cover. She's good, but not that good. Right. Well, when you come out with two handguns, here's what I'm expecting targets something to jump over mm -hmm. i want like a whole stage let me put these away sorry let me ah, i want a scared. whole yeah right i had guns out <laughs> uh i want a whole show you know maybe she if she gets through to vegas she has a horse and she's riding around on a horse shooting things mm -hmm. and she was just shooting the air and then she threw it up in the air like a baton and caught it and then we're shooting the air again. Yeah, I mean, I think her tricks consisted of how she handled the gun more than shooting it. Yeah. And moving. And then, and then she forces Nick Cannon to come in, and he puts this, I guess, stick? Yeah, it's like a stick or tube or something. In his mouth, and he is shaking, he's scared, and she has a whip, and she's whipping it. She whips it three times until it's really close to his mouth. And... It's kind of like one of those acts. It's cool if I was at a family party and this chick came out and did this. That'd be awesome. But to be on stage and do something like that, it was a little subpar for me personally. Yeah. It, it's like what she would do next is what she should have done first. Yes. You always think about like, what are you going to do first? Don't do that. Do the next thing. Mm -hmm. And she didn't. I don't care about bang, 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 bang. Not at all. Even though that was what enticed you initially, wasn't or it? Initially. Because <laughs> I'm like, we're going to see some things get shot. Yeah. And I didn't want them to be the lights. Yeah. Well, I, I, so she had kind of like two acts in one, and both were kind of not too impressive. Right. I've seen some really good uh, whip artists, mm -hmm. I guess I would call them. You know, they do the back thing and the front. Like, I feel like a standard thing of whipping is you whip the back first, then you whip the front. Yeah. And she didn't even do that. No, she didn't. Yeah. But, you know, she probably enjoyed herself on the stage. Let's hope. Because she's not going to Vegas, so let's hope so, right. yes. Next one. Brad Butters, 58 years old, from the University of Idaho. I think he teaches there. Not sure, so don't quote me on that. He is a sword swallower. Yes. 
uh, his fiance Tracy is out there supporting him, and he comes out and he has an X-rayish machine where you can see the blades going through his esophagus. Uh, it's, so he has nine double-edged, twenty-seven-inch swords, and uh, I don't know. I was really grossed out watching it, to be honest with you. It was impressive. I mean, every time there is one of those dangerous acts where you can really, really hurt yourself, I'm impressed. No doubt about it, especially if you survive. And I didn't, I wouldn't pay money to watch this. It's impressive, but I also want to throw up. I was agreeing with Mel B when she said, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't let you go through. Yeah, I, I didn't think there was anything special. All right, he brought out a machine that probably costs $2 million <laughs> and showed the x-ray. A, we are talking, you know, being cynical. They could have easily just had a pre-taped video, whatever. Even put that aside. Mm -hmm. Great, you saw the swords go in. I don't think anyone was sitting there like, oh, he's not really putting those swords in yeah. his throat. It's just, you know, I saw it in a James Bond movie. Someone was swallowing swords. It's not new. Uh-huh. I want a new level to it. I thought he brought out this uh, display with all these different swords. There was a curved sword. There were thicker swords. Yeah. I was like, awesome. This guy's going to swallow all these swords. Then he brought out like six skinny little swords. Like, that's yeah, I don't you're right. care. It, it would have been more original if he had an assortment of swords going down his throat. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, for me, the problem with these these acts that are so dangerous is that where do you go from there? What's he going to put in? 28 swords the next episode? Right. The next one, 29? Or maybe he'll do what you just recommended. Right. We'll but see. again, you know, everyone out there for future episodes, take my advice. Think about what you're going to do for the edition. Think about what you're going to do to step it up and do the step it up first before the original. It's true. But, you know, the first audition at the same time, you also have to be on top, have your A game. Right. And just have a really, really phenomenal performance. So I wouldn't say take your lowest, perf lowest act on on stage first. I would say no. I was saying the opposite. Mm -hmm. Take your oh, okay. second. You know, what are you going to do in Vegas? Do that for your first audition. I see what you're saying. I'm you sorry. Know, I just yeah. Late. It's all right. <laughs> I don't always say things correctly. <laughs> but you know, it's like if you're gonna win this competition, you better have the next 10 steps set out already. Know what you're going to do the next 10 rounds, and then whatever you're going to do for Vegas, do it first. Be really good at first. It was like last week, those dancers that said, oh, we thought of this last night. Yeah. Well, no, be really good now so that next time we see you, you're even better and even better. Because if you can't if you're afraid that you're showing everything at first, mm -hmm. then you're never going to get to a million dollars. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you completely that I like the idea of knowing that you have 10 acts ready, locked and loaded ahead of you just in case you make it. You need to have everything set up and ready to go because I'm sure everything just starts moving so fast the moment they get to Vegas. Right. So, yeah, that's a good point. And I was going to bring up the the act from last week as well, how they said, oh, we prepared this morning. It's They're really good, but I bet you they would have been even better if yeah. they prepared. And you never know. Like They do this some years where they'll get to Vegas and they'll say, all right, this group of people, you're not going to perform. You're mm -hmm. already through to the next yeah. act. Wouldn't you want to be that person instead of the like, well, you're still going to have to fight for it. Be even better than everyone who's already at Ve in yeah. Vegas. And then when it gets to the voting, people at home are going to be like, oh, these guys were always great. Yeah, that's true. Because people will remember, oh, you didn't you didn't practice. I don't yeah. know. Hey, let's say like two people were completely equal and one didn't practice. It's Right. And then so. they'll just vote for their friends anyway. <laughs> that's true. I would vote for my friend. I wouldn't. Unless it was the pistol pack in Paula. Sorry. Yeah. She was nice, though. Um, would you have given a yes or an X? To the sword? Yes. Probably no. I'd probably give him an X. I don't know if I would give him an X. Mm -hmm. I just would probably give him a no. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, I don't care where it's right. going. We're, you and I are a little harsher than the panel, the judges, because the only person that said no was Mel B. Right. And, well, same reasons in mind, the throw-up thing. Well, also, you know, the big difference is we're not there. 
That's true. I don't know if that would be that different, but maybe with the adrenaline on stage and the pressure, and also, like, you have to keep in mind, we know if it's on NBC, it's nothing bad happened already. That's true. When you're sitting there and you're like, is he going to get hurt? Is something going to happen? And then you're all happy that he isn't hurt. That's true. She has, they have that adrenaline, like yeah. you said. And also, we don't know what kind of acts they've seen just before. So it's true. it could have been a phenomenal act in comparison. So I'm all right with him going through. I just, yeah, I'm fine with it, but yeah. Well, okay. Next one was Collins key. He's 16. He is, uh, calls himself a close-up magician um he basically goes to the judge's table he gets off stage gives mel b a snack bag then gives heidi klum was it heidi klum or howard howard gave him a dollar yes howard gave him a dollar they read off the serial number he writes it down and then he lights this dollar bill on fire poof it ends up in the snack bag that may uh, mel, mel b opens I thought that was cool. I am all for magic tricks because you can do so many different things if you're a magician. Right. He was, I thought he was good. I liked it. I've seen something like that before where they do, I'm going to take this dollar, it's going to end up somewhere else. But that it was a closed bag of chips was cool. And the way he did it, and I know everyone's going to say, like, he's the next generation of magicians. He's 16. He didn't come out in a suit. He's not all flash. Yeah, he had a good look. I liked yeah. his look, too. He said snackage. He did say snackage, which was hilarious. And as I said, and you weren't happy with, he's the Justin Bieber of magic. Yes, because Justin Bieber is currently going through a lot of trouble. Well, he's a troubled youth. You try being 16 and having a billion dollars. He was fine, you know, until uh, Selena Gomez decided to goodbye. She circumcised him? Broke the relationship. Oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't know when you said. Well, who knows? Who knows what she did? When otherwise, you say snip, snip to a Jewish person. That's the first <laughs> thing we think of. I understand your fears. I'm just kidding. Um, well, the thing about Collins Keys, I'm kind of going for him because he was actually crying a lot. Like you can tell, he was really, really happy with his performance, and he didn't seem nervous at all. But he actually was pretty nervous. Yeah, he was, and he, that's also a good sign, is if you didn't know it on stage, and then backstage, he's nervous. Yeah. It was great. I, I liked it. I want to see more. I do, too. And it was, it was nice that he had the father-son touch as yeah. well. So that was good. He went through. Thank goodness. The next act was a ventriloquist named Megan. She was 20. She's a very, very pretty girl. Um, she had not one, but two dolls. One was a cat, and one was a little girl. And they started off singing a Whitney Houston tribute with a little girl doll and switched off to the cat singing opera. Okay, very impressive. For me, I'm not a ventriloquist fan. I'm not into dummies. They scare me myself. What did you think of it? Yeah, I uh, right away I think ventriloquism, and I think, all right, whatever. Mm -hmm. But the fact that she had something more to it because now you can't just say all right i can talk with my mouth closed and move a puppet with my hand mm. that's not anything that's too special anymore right. but her singing and the kind of operatic you know was really good yeah and that adds to it like they kind of said tonight um she could have been a good musical act if she didn't have the puppets and she was just singing on her own she would have been good so add the fact that she's not really moving her mouth. And, you know, she when she talked, she moved her lips a little more than most ventriloquists. I thought but, so, too. Yeah, but the fact that she was singing like that, I'm willing to watch it again. I would have said yes. You know, I'm curious to see where she goes from there. So it's the curiosity that would make you say yes. Yeah, exactly. Right. It was She was very talented. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just, I don't know. I mean, again, it's a genre that... I'm kind of done with. I used to love ventriloquists. Yeah. And I'm just kind of over it. Well, what's interesting about her is that she says she's extremely shy, yet this is her way to kind of express herself. Right. I was really impressed with the singing, and I'm curious, just like you. However, I'm curious to see what she sounds like without the puppets when she's able to open her mouth right. and really belt it out. Well, she might not be able to. Like, That's I know... True. A lot of uh, 
improv and stand up people that on stage they're outgoing, they're yelling at mm -hmm. you, they're you know doing these crazy voices, and off stage will be like, "Hey, good show." I'm like, "Oh, no, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate it." You know, it's the same thing. It's just whatever her thing is. And if you noticed, she had those puppets like a foot in front of her. Oh, she was. So you could really barely even see her. They're like you know out here. So that's her wall. Yeah, I, I really believed her story when she says she's super shy. I'm like, that's it's true. Right. She's she's exuding timidity. So she went through, and I understand. Um, the next act was Jonathan Allen from Tennessee. He was 20. This guy was phenomenal. His parents kicked him out because he was gay at 18. Oh, at 18, yes. Yeah. And he's saying, time to say goodbye. It was another opera. And he, I think for me, he surprised me a tiny bit more than the first act. Um, what was his name? Tim Pratt? Yes. Yeah. But he was very masculine, very baritone. And it was just, ugh, it was amazing. What did you think of this act? He was great. You know, the sub story aside, for me, yeah. it's like, I, I don't care. Okay. I'm not in it for the drama. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a terrible story. Sure. The fact that his parents kicked him out and for being gay. Mm -hmm. But like that to me, that doesn't affect whether he's good or not. You know, and mm -hmm. it, it just makes it worse because it's like if he has that story and then he's horrible, you're going to be like, oh, well. Uh, well, do you think they would air it? If he had that story and he was terrible, do you think NBC would have been, let's air this? I don't know. I don't know. But, you know, regardless, he was really good. He was really good. Did you like him or the, I think, well, for me, and this is jumping ahead, the two that really shined in this episode, and a lot of them were good, was him and then Tim Pratt. Yeah. He, um, they were great. Uh, I don't know. I can't say because it was both very different. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't expect either. Yes. And I do love, in a way, it's kind of breaking that stereotype, as I was laughing about it earlier. But if you think about it, it's breaking the stereotype of the big black guy sings tenor and the little gay guy sings baritone. Yes. You know, you don't expect it from either. You would think, oh, you know, if I played both of those for you on... Uh, a CD without telling you who's who, yeah. you would think it was opposite. I agree, yeah. And so I can't really say who I liked better. They were both really good. Well, yeah, and but the thing is, like, just the element of surprise, and it was yeah. just so good. And I love how Howie told him, well, your parents kicked you out, but you have a family here in America's Got Talent. I love you. I've never heard Howie say that before. Yeah. So that was really nice. I understand why he got the standing ovation, and I understand why he's going to Vegas. I can't wait to see more of him. Yeah, well, the thing with the standing ovation, and uh, I was going to get into this when it comes up, but I actually got to go and see a live episode this year. Nice. When they're in L.A., yeah, so I could talk more when that episode comes up. But the second one person stands up, the entire audience stands up. They kind of yeah. tell you, like, if people start standing up, just kind of go with them. They also get, uh, here's a little bit of magic, uh, <laughs> they get shots of people standing up and applauding when nobody's on stage. So, they, I mean, I'm sure he would have, I'm sure he got a real standing ovation, but it's very, you know, forced sometimes. Uh, that's going to be interesting to hear once, you, once we hit the L.A. auditions. I want to hear more from that because that's really cool. Um, the next one was the female escape artist, Alexandria the Great. She's in her 50s. You know, her. she has, she has three children, and then they just graduated. And she says she is only a handful of escape artists that are women, and this is an act where she can die. She takes the judges over to poolside, shackles her feet, hands, and there's a 30-foot chain, and she jumps in the pool, but she doesn't inhale before going in. She exhales. There's eight padlocks. And they also say there's a lot going on. To raise your hand and then take it down when you can't breathe anymore. I, I wouldn't last 20 seconds. What do you think of this escape act? I liked it. Yeah. It, you know, there have been a lot of escape artists in the past and currently. And I don't care that she's a woman. It doesn't make a no, difference. No, it does woman, not. Guy. But... 
she did something that was different from a lot of escape acts, which is she did it in a real pool. A lot of times it's a tank they bring mm -hmm. on stage and who knows what they could be doing in there. And they might have, you know, a hatch that you can't see. They're not completely in water, whatever it may be. But the fact that she's in a pool, I thought really added. And she, you know, she milked it. You she were did. like, oh, she's taking so long. But no, she's making you freak out because she's been underwater for over a minute and a half. She completely made me freak out. I was starting to really worry. Yeah. And you had an interesting, um, what's the word? Theory. Theory. Thank you. Yeah, well, the, it was funny because Howard kind of joked about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was Howard, maybe Howie, one of them, joked about it saying, oh, she was making out with Nick Cannon, and he gave her the key from his mouth. Mm -hmm. Well, her husband kissed her right before she started so my thinking is he had the key in his mouth he kissed her slipped her the key that's how she got it regardless she did it yeah and i can't prove that well we can press rewind and maybe you can prove it maybe you can't probably but not regardless it was a great act but she did also say that her husband is her teammate right so that could be a little hint right and you know that doesn't take away from it the no fact absolutely is, not. it was great you give me a key in my hand and I probably won't be able to unlock myself <laughs> underwater. Right. Me too. I wouldn't be able to go down there for more than 20 seconds. But that was a good act. I got worried. I thought it was great. And she went through. So, and before we go any further, I wanted to thank our listeners to for listening. And uh, I would love it if uh, you can go to iTunes and rate and comment this new season of America's Got Talent. We're bringing the show for you, and we love to hear what you guys are thinking, good or bad. And we like to give you back our feedback as well. So go ahead and rate. Tell a friend. Tell one a day. We have over 60 shows or more going on this season. So definitely After Buzz has got an after show for you. Yeah, right that you liked it. Right, Tell us how great we are. Tell us that I look like Crispin Glover. Tell us a whole <laughs> bunch of awesome things. Tell them how cool his Thor shirt is. My sh Thor shirt is really cool. It's very, very Super cool. Super cool. Yeah, voice. See? And you can also go to YouTube and comment as we comment back. And thank you for tuning in. We appreciate all the support. All right. So now we've got number 12. J.C. Starbright. With a name like that, we kind of knew what might have yep. been coming. He's a computer programmer by day, and he says his talent is writing songs. 59-year-old man. His talent is writing songs. That's what he says. He doesn't say his talent is a singer, but writing songs. So already I was pretty um, skeptical about his per future performance. And he, he says he's going to be the next Lady Gaga. The judges joke he's the next lady guy guy. I did not like it. Yeah, I I said this again. Let's go back to last week. All right, rewind. Let's take mm -hmm. the TARDIS to last week. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, with um, JT, the rocker, whatever his name was, the booty guy from last week, oh, the last actor. Oh, yes, had. the last one. Mm -hmm. um, B double O T Y. <laughs> he came out, and I I said this: if you're gonna come out and you're gonna do something like that, that's obviously comedy, and you're doing it for one reason, mention it. He came out and he said, "I want to be a one-hit wonder," and he sang his song, and everyone liked it, and he's gonna be a one-hit wonder. Yes. Where this guy, uh, Starbright, J C Starbright, uh, you know he comes out serious and he does his thing and it's terrible and they do the thing every year where it's so bad that they play it again and everybody sings you know and you think that this guy's being serious so if he thought it was a joke then great let's you know see what other funny thing he can do with it but he's not going to be able to. And do you think he's thinking it's a joke, or do you think this is no. really his? Yeah. I don't think I it's don't a think joke, so and that's part of it. It's when someone like that is serious, and you're like, I'm laughing at a mentally deranged man. Yeah, he brings out a portable recording studio, and the worst thing is, is he forgets his words. Yeah. How you do you... don't have many words in your song. <laughs> you wrote the song. 
<laughs> Maybe don't forget them. And it's so funny because how he calls him out, and he at first he says, "Yeah, I did," and the second time, he's like, "No, I didn't forget the words." Yes, you did, bro. Yeah. Rewind. He brings out Nick Cannon, and then Nick Cannon plays around with him, but it was not an enjoyable act. And it was funny because you said that Mew has competition. Yep. <laughs> it, you know, we'll see them at the end of the year when they bring out all the crazies on stage to dance together. Mm -hmm. He'll be there with his guitar and half shirt. Midrift. I, I think Excuse Mew was, me. <laughs> there's a difference you want to show. Half shirt could be this way too, right? Could be. Could but be. It's not. it's not. Sorry, halter top. Midrift. Yeah. You're a midrift. Am I? What? Don't worry about it. <laughs> so, number 13 was Andrew Ward. 34-year-old ghost storyteller. I was, as a kid, I loved ghost stories. I was really interested to see what he had up his sleeve, but that was a very short-lived act. It was not good. He had like a fake heart, he threw it. All the judges said no, except for Mel B, because she's Scary Spice, so she likes all things scary. Right. What did you think? It was stupid. I was <laughs> expecting something cool. When you come out and do something like that, I thought his story was going to go along, and then, you know, maybe there was projections, or he was going to have something pop up and somehow act out this ghost story. You know, do something mm -hmm. really cool. Instead, he just stood there and told a ghost story. Yeah, and that's exactly what he did. threw out a toy heart that he bought at KB Toys in 1996. <laughs> I think my ki uh, my kids, I don't have kids. My my friends and I, when we were kids, told each other better ghost stories than this right. man here. So let's uh, move on to Sam Johnson. He comes in with a top hat, and he says he's going to do a handstand. And you and I both look and think, this is a joke, right? But he takes the judges and the audience members outside to an 80-foot pole, and it's super windy, and he's going to do a handstand on the very, very top of this pole. What did you think of this act? I thought it was great. He definitely played up the danger, mm -hmm. especially with the wind, and still did it. And, mm -hmm. you know... End of the day, it's a handstand, <laughs> but, you know, putting the danger there makes it entertaining and makes you definitely want to know what's next. Is he going to do another handstand from, you know, 20 feet higher? I don't care if he does, and but if he does something crazy. I'm not going to lie. Even just climbing up that pole for me was a feat of its own. Because it was really windy and he had to be really strong. I was really scared and I thought it was a great act. I just don't know where else he would be doing handstands in the future. Right. It's like last year they had the greatest named act in the world, mm -hmm. Professor Splash, who jumped in off the high dive into a shallow pool. Cool. And then the second time he did it, okay, still kind of cool. And then the third time he did it, like, all right. He's done that. Well, it's yeah. kind of like the cannonball guy from last season as well. Right. After a while, you want to see something different. Yeah, it's just like making it a little hi little higher. I'm not, yeah. you know, too impressed. If he, you know, does a handstand while on a unicycle on a high wire, then maybe I'll be like, okay, that cool. That would be cool. I hope that he's listening to you. Yes. Uh, well, how could he not be listening <laughs> to me? I hope that that's one of his 10 acts up his sleeve because that would actually be really, really impressive. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, if he makes it to the finals, lasers. Yes, lasers and smoke on behalf of Nick. Right, but <laughs> mostly lasers. <laughs> and, you know, he has a five-year-old son, and so it's also a little bit of that sob story, so that was kind of sweet. And then yeah. we have, go ahead. I was just going to say, it's like, yes, it's a sob story, but it's like, great, he's going to die and orphan his son. Well, he did say he wouldn't orphan his son. He so. said that. Yeah. I'm not going to lose $10,000 at Comic-Con this year, but I might. Are you really going to lose $10,000? No, I'm not going. Because you have 10000 bucks going to Comic-Con. I Comic don't have $10,000. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, on the last act of the night, uh, you overhear the judges being told that there's only six minutes, so finish up. And it was a student, 19-year-old. And his name is Paul Thomas Mitchell from Memphis, Tennessee. His mom and dad are both were, past tense, excuse me, mom and dad were alcoholics, 
uh, the father went to AA class and got better. And ever since then, the father and him are having a much better relationship. And so Paul Thomas Mitchell writes a song called My Life for his dad. And he tears up and he sings. And then everyone liked it. Right. Did you like it? Were you included in this mix? I mean, it was a good song. It was well written. He's a good singer. But I'm kind of done with the whisper singers. Like, maybe it's just me. But yeah, it was very John Mary. He was. I don't need, you know, any more. Your eyes are beautiful. I give him credit, though, for actually writing this song. Because a lot of people come on, come on stage and they just sing a famous song or they write a terrible song like uh, J.C. Bright, whatever his name was, right. which was terrible. And this guy, you know, he, he fell through. He wrote a good song. Fell through. He wrote a good song and he sang well. And it was an inspiring song also because it was made for his father. So right. I can see how it touched a lot of people in different aspects. So I, I, I totally give him a uh, go through. Right. Yeah, I would, you know, like I said, or like you said, let him go through. Yeah. <laughs> it's just not something I care about. And it's funny, and we'll probably see this later in the season, is everyone was happy that he wrote his own song and mm -hmm. it was good. But then there's going to be an act where they're going to say, well, you're a good singer, but you have to sing something that people know. They do that every year. Do you think so? They, yeah, they always do. It'll be one person, and it was mostly Sharon Osbourne, so who knows? But it's always like, oh, you were really good. I like that you made your own song. And then someone else, it's like, no one knows the song. People want to hear songs they know. So it's just, I guess, up to the singer, bottom line. That's true. And I think he picked a, a, good, a good act to pick that particular song to be his song to perform in front of the judges to make him go through it was it was good and that basically concluded this uh, week's america's got talent um yeah i think overall most of the acts went through it was a really talented panel of people this week what yeah, did you it was think surprising yeah and who for you who stood out um I mean, mostly I'd say the close-up magician, mm -hmm. but that's for me. Like, I like magic. I like magic, I want, too. I want to see something a little different from singing and dancing and whatever. So I think he definitely stood out. Uh, Alexandra the Great uh, yeah. stood out to me. Um, I don't know. Who else? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think I've mentioned before that I was really most shocked by Travis Pratt and... Yes. Um, Thank you, Travis Pratt. Allen. I forgot his first yeah, name. Guy. Jonathan Allen. But when you mention the magician, you're right. I love magic tricks. And his act was cool. I've never seen that kind of magic trick before with the, with the snack bag. And he's young. He's useful. He has something going for him. So, yeah, I, I definitely would put all those in the mix as, as well as escape artists. So. Yeah. I enjoyed him more than I enjoyed Now You See Me. Yeah. I agree. I completely agree. Do you agree with my opinion? Yes, I do. Thank you for letting me have but, my opinion. But, you know, people didn't really like Now You See Me, actually. Yeah, that's for After Buzz movies. Do you not like me agreeing with your opinion? No, it's fine. Okay, good. It's just the way you said, I agree with you having that opinion. I agree with you having <laughs> this opinion because you are a smart man. That is why. Ah, oh, thanks. <laughs> All right, well, that about wraps it up. In the meantime, have you established a Twitter where people can follow you? Well, it's funny you mention that. No. You have not. No. Uh, can I plug a show or is that not Yes, okay? plug on your Since show. Since I don't have Twitter, uh, check out on Facebook Doctor Who Live. I'm sure there's not a lot of Doctor Who America's Got Talent crossover, but if there is, I do a biweekly Doctor Who themed improv show at the improv olympic in los angeles nice so check us out on facebook please i will check you out oh thanks see i'm agreeing with you go check him out and you can find me at k-a-o-r-i-o-u-s on twitter as well as facebook and you can follow everyone here at after buzz at after buzz tv 
And thank you guys for tuning in. We'll see you next week. From Bing.com, executive producers Maria Menunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Buzz, Buzz you later. later. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.